ಮುರದೀ ವಿನೋದಕಾರಿ ಪಲಪನ ವಿಸರೇ ನಹಿ ಜೋ ವಿಸಾರಿ ಜುಗಲ ಚರನ ಸೋಲ ಚಿನ್ನ ಜೇಹ ನಜರ ಸಮೀಪೆ ರಹೋ ಅಮಾರಿಯೇಹ ಘನಶ್ಯಾಮ್ ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ನಿಜ ಸ್ವಾಮಿನಾರಾಯಣ ಭಗವಾನ್ ನಿಜ Supreme Almighty, our beloved Gansham Maharaj, Pujyapad Guruji, Pujya Santo and all of you devotees, Jai Swami Narayan. You know, life can be full of ups and downs. Meaning, in life, in our life particularly, we have a lot of good days and we have bad days. we don't know when they're coming we don't know when they're going it's unexpected and all of a sudden we have a good day just in a couple hours it turns into a bad day this just doesn't apply to you even doctors go through this even lawyers go through this even an entrepreneur a businessman goes through this even a millionaire goes through this and even a billionaire goes through this even a jobless person goes through it and even a poor person goes through it everyone experiences good days and bad days on a daily experience even as a student there's always a good day and always a bad day take for example on a good day <clears throat> even if we're running really late we wake up our bus arrives at our street at 7 10 a.m. and we just wake up at let's say 6:55 you just have 15 minutes to brush shower do your puja and then pack for school in 15 minutes well obviously it's really really difficult to do but you still make it somehow and you catch the bus even after you get into your school you forgot you have your teacher told you you have a pop quiz in your math class yet you didn't even study and he still aced the quiz what do you know you have a good day not only that but in your after school debate competition which you didn't prepare for but somehow you defeat the number one team in your you can say county that's very good luck for you overall your day goes excellent without any kind of effort that you would consider a good day on the other hand there's bad days in the same exact scenario instead of waking up at 6:55 a.m. to catch your 7:10 bus you actually wake up at 6:00 a.m. your usual time to take a shower do your puja and then take a little breakfast and then catch or go to the bus stand at 7 and in 10 minutes your bus will be there you planned everything out you're solid you're ready to go it's like no other day but somehow due to some kind of circumstance you missed the bus so it starts now well somehow you barely get a ride from your parents who are also running late for their work and you get to school you're a little late for your class but your teacher passes it by now you know and your teacher has told you for the past week that you have an exam in history for chapters 5 to 10 and you studied you didn't only study you really studied you got a little tutoring you actually went to the library and you actually caught up with some friends with the same class and you studied with them i mean there's no better preparation you can do for this exam you get to the exam class you sit 
Your teacher tells you, you have an exam, obviously you know that for a week. You start taking the exam, and all the information that you memorize for the exam, completely, you don't have in your mind anymore. Somehow, something happens. You don't know what happens, you didn't know what happened, and you just have a blank head. So obviously you start to panic because time is running out as well as you want to do well on the exam, but obviously you're trying to remember some points. So you just guess throughout the whole exam. You know you've done well, bad. Yet, with some kind of bold feeling to make yourself feel better, you just tell yourself, I did good because I studied for one week. I went to the library. I also went with my friends and studied together. So I did well. You tell yourself this, but on the other side, subconsciously, you know that you've done bad. Lastly, in your debate competition, after school, the team which is worst in your county, you get completely, just completely devoured by them. They give you a thrashing and you lose to them by a huge amount. Your debate coach is completely upset with all of you, <clears throat> especially you, because you're the star, yet you couldn't come up with any points to counterfeit or counter the other team. So this is your bad day. <clears throat> you don't know where it came from. Everything was planned from a week ahead. Your exam, you even woke up on time and still missed the bus. The debate team, which is Worcester and County, you got defeated by. It's like, what's going on? And that's when it hits you. <clears throat> I might have done something wrong. Now, this is just for a student's life. But I don't know if you knew, but as even a devotee of Bhagwan, sometimes you receive or you get bad days and good days. Not academically. I'm, I just gave an example of that, but more so on a base of, you can say, your mind is not stable. You don't feel confident about yourself. You don't feel peace at heart. This happens time to time as a devotee, sometimes more than other times. And you wonder that, you know, I go to religion, <clears throat> I'm religious, I follow everything, I come to Mandir, I associate with saints. Yet, why do I receive some kind of misery or pain in my life? There has to be something. Because I'm doing everything accordingly. I do the Tilak Chanlo, I wear the Kanti, I associate with saints. Yet, there's always something going on. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. But, I want to inquire about the bad. Why is this happening? I mean, for a person in the outside world, we can obviously you know, understand that their life is based off of karma, meaning the good karma they've done, they're rich and they have a good life, supposedly. Or the bad karma they've done, off of that, they're poor or they have bad days. This we can project and this we can definitely tell. And this happens to everyone, doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs, millionaires, billionaires, each and every person, as I described before. But as a devotee, there's bad days and good days. That's a head scratcher, you probably would say. But let me tell you the reason for that. The only reason why devotees have bad days is because they have broken the code of conduct or the agna or the command of Bhagwan in some way, or they have hurt the heart of a follower or a saint of Bhagwan. Meaning, if someone has insulted someone, then if that person's heart is broken, due to that, Bhagwan punishes that person for doing that. Now, this is when we start to think that <clears throat> I've never done anything like that. First, you're in denial. That, you know, I don't do things like that. And I'm a good devotee, so I don't think that applies to me. But indirectly, you may have done something to 
to someone but you don't know of. You might have pained someone, not verbally, but even thinking about someone badly, that this, this devotee here, he doesn't know how to eat, or he doesn't know how to do dhanvad, or this devotee is very, very, he always gets angry. How could he come to mandir? How could he be called a devotee? Any of these kinds of small characteristics we see, and from that, we take their fault, or we take their, you can say, negative influence, and we bring it into ourselves. Due to that, we become miserable. Let me give you an example in the time of Bhagwan Swaminarayan. On the occasion, <coughs> there's a saint called Vrajananan Swami. He was a nun sant uh, initiated by Bhagwan Swaminarayan himself. And Vrajan Swami was always touring the region of Gujarat for spreading satsang, doing vichran. So he came to the village of Thordi. <coughs> there was a local farmer by the name of Mega there who lived in the village. Now Mega was completely against the Swaminarayan religion and his saints, his devotees, everything. But Rajanand Swami knew this factor, but he ignored it. What he did was he held assemblies in the village and everyone would gather and they would really love Swami's talks. And Mega would not join, but he would be present there somehow doing something and he would overhear these talks. And he would think in his mind that this Rajanand is just foley. He's, a, he's wrong. He's, a, he's just trying to spread Swaminarayan's name who Swaminarayan himself is also a foley or a fake person. He's not Bhagwan. How could we say he's Bhagwan? Such kind of thoughts occurred in his mind, obviously because he was completely against the religion. Moreover, this was only in his head. Then one day, he couldn't bear Swami's talks. So he tells, told Swami, the hell with you, Rajananan. I don't want to even see you in this village anymore. Get out of this village. Now, there was an outburst and the devotees there didn't like it at all. But Swami, with his saintliness, pretty much agreed to this and left the village. Now, what Mega did not know was that he planted a small bomb, a very small bomb inside of himself that's going to ignite and blow up in a short period of time. That bomb was insulting Rajananda Swami. Now, after Swami left, everything was back to normal and Mega was in his usual routine. And one night he was taking dinner in his dinner table. And in those days, they didn't have electricity, especially in India, in Gujarat. So they used candles to light up the room. So the candle was lit and uh, Mega was taking dinner on his table. And all of a sudden, a gust of wind must have blown and the candle blew out. The candle blew out and Mega continued to take his dinner, just like usual. He didn't think that anything was wrong. But a cat snuck in through the opening of a crack of a door and completely jumped on the table, saw the food. Obviously, the cat was after the food jumped on the table and took some food and the cat had a poisonous insect inside of its mouth so it dropped that off instead and picked up a little bit of food from Mega's dish and went back out obviously Mega did not even know about this and he continued to eat and that insect he also ate because obviously it was dark he didn't know and he ate the insect, and after that, he started to get a reaction. The insect was poisonous, and he started to vomit, and diarrhea also occurred. And his body was completely in really bad condition. And so all the villagers, his relatives, his family, gathered and tried many, many kinds of uh, you know medicine, called many, many doctors to try to cure what had happened to him because it was all of a sudden. But no one found out. Then after they concluded that, you know, Rajanan Swami, or a couple, a couple weeks back when Rajanan Swami was here in the village, 
preaching. Mega insulted Swami due to this insult. He is receiving this kind of pain and misery. And due to that, he is suffering from this physical pain, you can say. So he suffered much. And Rajananda Swami found out after about six months that Mega was suffering like this. So he prayed to Bhagwan that please cure him from this, you know, disease, you can say, and let him be free from this disease, you can say. And from that time, Mega was cured. But the whole point of this story is that Mega thought bad of saints or insulted saints in some kind of, not maybe direct way, but in an indirect way mentally. And due to that, not only his day, but six months of his life became miserable and he had to suffer physically and I'm sure mentally as well because he regretted doing this due to that. But the main message to this whole story is the basis of one should not insult any saints or one should not insult any devotees of Bhagwan. If so, and we get away with it and we think that nothing will happen to us, well, you can think again because the reason of that is that not maybe that time or that week or that two weeks, but in the future, something will, something bad will come. Some kind of misery or pain will come. And the only way to erase that misery or pain is to go to that saint or devotee that you have insulted or pained and apologize sincerely. And if that devotee and saint accepts your apology, then only will be you will you be cured of that pain or that misery. So, just like how doctors, lawyers, and businessmen have some kind of ups and downs, you can say maybe uh, financially, or even if you're a doctor, let's say, uh, you misdiagnose patients and they actually get some kind of allergic uh, reaction and they sue you and many things can happen. Or even if you are a businessman and you become bankrupt and your business goes down the drain, or even if you're a billionaire and you have millions and millions of dollars invested in property and stocks and they go down and you lose millions and millions of dollars, that's nothing to worry about compared to satsang. Why? Because all these things can be gained back again. But the only thing one cannot gain back again is after painting or after hurting or insulting any devotees of God or saints or anyone in satsang, one cannot get back their happiness or their rajipo if they do not apologize sincerely and if they do not sincerely think of them in a good way. So, in satsang, there's many, many scenarios. There's many, many times. There's many, many situations where we have to deal with many, many people. And each and every person has different characteristics, virtues, qualities. And maybe our, you can say, nature does not match with other people's nature. But that or other devotees' nature. But that doesn't mean that we have to take their negative influence or we have to look bad upon them. But the best thing to do, according to Bhagavan Swamiyaran and the Vajramrut, is a person who wants to progress, according to Gurdada for chapter 53rd Vajramrut, a person who progresses always takes the good quality of the devotee, he takes the bad quality of himself, and after that, he lives in satsang with a divya drashti, or you can say a divine vision. We talked about many, many lectures before about gun grahak drashti, meaning quality grasping vision. And if one develops this in satsang, then one would become flawless. And that's the only way to rise in satsang. So, I encourage each and every one of you whoever goes to Mandir or whoever has sabhas or whoever associates with devotees, especially, that 
do not ever take the negative influence of anyone or you'll become like that negative influence even if that person has it or he doesn't have it but the best thing to do and the best thing for our day to always stay up and good is to take the quality of his devotees and saints saying this my humble jay swami वर्णिवेशरमणीय दर्शन मंदहासुचिराननाबुज पूजित सुरनरोतमेर्मुदा धर्मनंदनमह विचित श्रीघनश्याम महाराज ने जय ऑल माइटी सुप्रीम लॉर्ड और बिलउड कंश्याम महाराज पूज्य पाद गुरु जी पूज्य भगत जी एंड ऑल ऑफ यूडियोटिस जय स्वामीनारायण People often say, without water and food, nobody can live on this earth. This is the basic need and necessity of a human being. But now, in this current age of technology, if any young boy, if he if he restricted to use of his iphone or any smartphone then can it possible he can live happily definitely no because in this age of technology most of the persons themselves desire for using a newest technology only for pleasuring their senses they have no any particular use of the instrument only for enjoying the sensual pleasure they use this iphone smartphones internet and all the other technological instruments our scriptures our religion our beloved bhagwan himself also says not only the worldly people cannot live without enjoying the pleasure but the same way a staunch devotee of bhagwan he also cannot live without enjoying the pleasure but something is different a person who is devotee of bhagwan and a person who is non believer who does not believe in god these two types of person 
when we observe the activities of both the persons we can find out that the desire and their attraction towards the worldly things which can pleasurable which can enjoyable the attitude of both the devote, both the persons are definitely different because both have a totally different intention a devotee always desire to have a sensual pleasure only and only related to bhagwan on the other hand a non believer never even discriminate between which is god related pleasure or which is not god related pleasure this is the basic difference for this bhagwan swami narayan himself says bhagwan said in the vachanamrut 32 chapter gurda first after thinking for quite some time sri ji maharaj said in this world of materialistic individual who is attached to the vices cannot survive without indulging in them moreover just as that non believer indulges in vices similarly a devotee of god also indulges in vices what is this vices vices means the anything or anything that that can give us pleasure just like a pizza most of the people like pizza and for the pizza pizza can give them a pleasure of tongue taste in this way bhagwan swami narayan says here that just as materialistic people has a vices he all he indulges in the vices similarly a devotee of god also indulges in vices however the two are different in what way well the materialistic person who is attached to the vices enjoys only worldly vices whereas for a devotee of bhagwan listening to discourses of god is the only vices for his ears touching the holy feet of god or touching the holy dust from the feet of the sun is the only vices for his skin doing darshan of god or the sun is the only vices for his eyes taking the prasad of god and singing his praises are the only vices for his tongue and smelling the flowers and other objects which have been offered to god is the only vices for his nose in this manner there is a difference between the vices that non believer indulges in and those that a uh, devotee indulges in this is the main difference now as we are listening this discourses related to god so we definitely a devotee of bhagwan the question is that bhagwan himself also asked the same question in this vachanamrut whether our eyes and just only the scene which is related to god meaning bhagwan's divine form a uh, darshan of saint and devotees or also desire to have a uh, enjoy the scene which is not related to god we should ask this question our own self and introspect how much our eyes our nose our skin our tongue indulges in the worldly vices as well as the vices related to bhagwan non believer means outside people also enjoys the pizza and a duty of god also eating the pizza but both are the different non believer who is not believe in god is always eating pizza from outside if not pizza and anything else then he eats even in his house with onion garlic etc a devotee of bhagwan if he eats pizza his pizza is homemade 
without onion and garlic. This is what the basic different. Not only this, but a devotee who eat pizza, his pizza is first offered to Bhagwan. Then, as a prasad, a devotee of God always enjoys the pleasure of the pizza. This is what Bhagwan want to make us in such a way that we can only enjoy the anything or any object related to Bhagwan. Now the question is that why should we indulge ourselves enjoying or accepting any things or pleasure from God related objects? The answer is also described in the 18th chapter. Bhagwan in this Vachanamrut says, Just as one's mind is polluted by association with the immoral, association with God or his son purifies one's mind. Even if one's mind is polluted, it is purified by listening to the words of God and his son. The mind is similarly purified by the touch. If, however, due to the constraints of one's religious vows, however, one is unable to touch such a great son, then merely touching the dust of his feet to one's head makes one pure. Likewise, one is purified by the darshan of the great son. This is what the reason behind accepting and enjoying only God-related objects. If we indulge ourselves in enjoying and accepting the wo- any things or any objects only related to God, our mind becomes pure. It is just like you have a water of glass which is full. And if you want to pour more water in the glass, it is not possible. If you pour then all the water by overflowing from the glass wastage. And now if you want to pour if you want to save your water and if you want really use of that water, then you have to do one thing and that is your empty your glass. If your glass is empty then you want uh, According to your wish, you can save the water. You can keep water in the glass. Same in our life. If we have much more bad qualities, bad habits, some vices in our life, some bad nature, this is what our mind and our heart is filled with. Now if we empty these all bad things from our heart, then Bhagwan and his son can pour a pure things in our heart. But for this for cleaning this uh, cleaning our heart we have to first wash out our bad things from our heart. And for this we have to stop enjoying the outside or worldly objects. And simultaneously we should start input whatever we desire, whatever we like, but all the objects related only to God. If we fill our heart with only God related things, then God automatically remember in our mind. The form of God is no doubt very difficult to constantly remember on. But if our heart is filled with all pure things, all things which is related only to God, then our mind is also controlled because it becomes purified and our pure mind is always support us to concentrate on the form of God. Now if our heart is pure, 
our religious life become very prosperous and we can enjoy a real bliss of bhagwan we have committed so many sins not only this birth but also in previous births so definitely our heart is first not pure not clean our heart is filled with such bad qualities in our heart but if we want to concentrate on the form of god which is our main goal then we have to first wash out our bad habits from our heart then if we have a contact we have a company of a great saint saint can give us pure things our own self with our own personal endeavor we can stop to in uh, stop to enjoy outside our objects and we can also do one thing and that is to indulge ourselves only in god related wishes god related things if we do this procedure then god also resides in our heart and when god resides in our heart we can also feel that i am become totally changed my heart is changed my mind is changed my thoughts my thinking process everything is changed my behavior is also changed this is what a person who try to do try to pass from this process he can feel now bhagwan wants from us as a devotee of him bhagwan says every devotee should indulge only in the object that is related to god or his son because bhagwan also dwells forever in the son in the ekantik son and just as in the 18th vachanamrit bhagwan says one can also purify one's mind by listening the discourses from a discourse related to god from the sun touching the holy dust from the feet of sun that reason for this is that bhagwan himself also resides in the heart of ekantik sun and if we have a contact of such a sun then we should realize we should remember the words of bhagwan swami nar himself of the vachanamrut that whenever we got the opportunity to have a darshan of such a sun we should believe that i have or we have a darshan of bhagwan himself in this way there is a difference between a devotee and a non believer and when our all activities our all sensual pleasure become only god related then we will become a staunch devotee of bhagwan swami narayan and our mind and our heart also become pure and after become pure heart bhagwan himself resides in our heart and he himself gave us his divine glimpses in our dream whenever we are free there is no any activity we have to do at the time bhagwan himself remi- reminder us to focus on his divine form this is the uh, not a very tough process but this is very easiest way only given up or only renounce the worldly things not the worldly things but we should also accept and enjoy those things before accepting we should offer it to bhagwan and the son then those things become uh purified as those things 
came into contact of Bhagwan and his son, then we can use it as a prasad. This is the method of purifying our mind and our heart. Now let us start from today. We have time, we have this young age so that we can do whatever we wish. If we have a target to obtain a very good rank or score or highest marks in the highest point in the examination, we can do that. Same thing, we can also, if we wish and if we try, to do this thing that not accepting and not enjoying outside or worldly things and enjoying and accepting only things which is related to God and his son we can do this also now it is our duty and from this day I think all of the listeners do this not eat outside food not enjoying any movie which is not related to God, not smelling the fragrance of outsides means which is not related to God, not touches elsewhere. In this way our all sensual organs become pure and our mind and heart is also pure and by purifying our heart and mind Bhagwan himself resides in our heart. This is the process of concentrating on God as well as purifying our heart by saying this my humble Jai Swami Narayan Ganshyam Maharajani Jai Sri Patim Sri Dharam Sarvadeveshwaram Bhakti Dharmatmajam Vasudevam Har Madhavam Keshavam Kamadam Karanam Swami Narayanam Nilakantham Vajai Sri Ganshyam Maharajani Jai